actually hit the drums. Just hit them. Yep. Yes, I think that's it. Okay, so that is. I was like, yeah, I know. That's the one pager, right? Yeah. Okay, good. No, it's actually two pages. For me, one pager. Hey, Mike. No, he's not going to hear me. Yeah. Were you all up? Good morning, Valley Christian. I'm going to ask you guys to stand if you guys are able. We're going to praise the Lord today. There's a lot to be thankful for. We're going to start with I thank God. Are you ready to rock One, two, oh three. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones, I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. A bag of bones. Just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. Oh, you picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you healed my heart. deny what I've seen got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so so long to my old friends burning in bitterness you can just keep the moving nah you ain't welcome here God's love is so good and so perfect and amazing, um, and I think that's why this song, I Could Sing of Your Love Forever, just fits that so perfectly. This is how it goes. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love.
mountains and the sea. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. Go on and 
and tell it to the masses that He is God. Yes, you are. You are God. We proclaim you. Shout it to you. Hell within a manger, the sun. Promise was delivered unto a virgin bride, the one who would be called Emmanuel. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name. Shout this out. And the angels cry. Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. Savior born today, the one who would be called Emmanuel. Behold the host of heaven, with holy roar proclaim, the one who would be called Emmanuel, the Messiah, our God is with us now.
Let's, uh, let's, let's close our eyes and pray really quick. Father, thank you for being with us here this morning, Lord. I pray that you stay with us this entire morning, God, and, and prepare us for the message, Lord. Spiritually wake us up, Lord. Prepare us. Open up our minds, open up our ears, and open up our hearts, Lord, to, to hear what you want to say, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. 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 All right, so this is Matthew 1.1 1, 1, and Matthew 1.23 in Spanish. All right, this is Matthew 1.1 1, 1, and Matthew 1.23 in Spanish. Registro genealógico de Jesucristo, hijo de David y de Abraham. La Virgen concibirá y dará a luz un hijo y lo llamarán Emmanuel, que significa Dios con nosotros. Okay, so I have a slew of announcements. A slew means a lot, okay? So we need to do something the most important first. I'm going to ask you just to join me. Uh, it's something God really put on my heart to do very, very first. Um, there's just some people like uh, Doug's not here today because he's been sick. He is recovering, getting better. Lisa stayed with home with him today. Um, Kim Tiano has really been struggling, folks, with her health and all. And she was sick most of the night last night. I want to pray for Kim, for God just to heal her. And just various people going through hard times, various people sick. And I just want to pray, especially for Doug and, and Kim especially today. And, um, and so we're going to do that. And I'm going to ask you to jump out of your comfort zone. If you're sitting next to someone you know, I want, to, want you to agree. There's something about when we agree in prayer um, with one another, there's something about that's the seed of power. That There's such great power when we pray with another person and agree. And so I believe uh, that's that last song. All thrones and dominions and everything is under his name. Amen. All, everything. He owns it all. He's in charge. God is. And that's, he's got the final say over all this mess that's out in the world. And everybody said, Amen. So I want you to think, and there's, there's someone I haven't mentioned, I apologize. But as you pray, if you would pray for someone you know, but especially pray for Doug and for Kim today, I'm going to let you do that. Find somebody that you're next to and hold their hand and just pray together. Will you do that right now?
Thank you, Jesus. So, God, we thank you. We just thank you that you are the Lord God Almighty. All things are under you, Lord, regardless of what we see, what we think, or what our opinion is. You rule and you reign. And that's why we can come to you in the name of Jesus and present all these things. Thank you for your love, Lord God. Thank you for hearing our prayer today in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> okay. So Doug got texted me the list. It's literally a full page. It's a... Yeah. I could say a lot of things. I love him. And I'm so thankful for him. So, uh, last week's harvest dinner was awesome. So we ate really big twice in a week. Not necessarily healthy, but thank you. Uh, I guess there's a whole crew, but it's headed by Kurt and Jane, uh, Rick and Roberta. There was others back there. Thank you. Thank you so much. It came off... Yeah, that was next level cooking. Praise God. Thank you. Um, also, where's my friend Lori? Lori, will you come up? If you look around, how many, I even noticed, I noticed that we have decorations. That's a miracle. But I want Lori just to mention real quick. Yeah, so a couple of things have changed since last Sunday. I hope people noticed. We had an amazing crew here yesterday. Everybody who was here yesterday to help out, stand up. I want everybody to see all the people that helped. Look at this, you guys. It was amazing. Right on. Oh, my goodness. It was great. We still have a couple, you know, little hiccups to work out. Um, so here's... <laughs> You know, the, the garland um, is up, and that's wonderful. Um, what I've decided is it's going to be an Advent garland. So every week, one more strand will be lighted up. So you have to come. You have to come the whole season. Like See? That. There you go. But thank you, everyone who helped. Um, Oh, and in the back, at that Christmas tree back there, you will see some ornaments. And they have the names of Jesus on them and with the scripture reference on the back. I put some Sharpies back there on the back. If you want to write your name and put it on that tree, or you can do your family name or whatever. And then at the end of the season, if you want to take it home, you can, or we will just put them up next year and then we'll have a new design next year and it will be like a little family you know, a little history, right? So isn't it fun? I, yeah. So anyway, just make sure that you, um, that you grab an ornament back there, whatever name of, of Jesus resonates with you and put your name on the back and stick it on the tree. Awesome. Thank you. Right. And Lori, thank you for your leadership on that. That you did a great job. I didn't, honestly, I didn't do anything. You guys, oh, no, no, seriously. This crew was so good. They knew where everything was. They were just putting stuff up. It was nuts. I was just like, why am I here? No, it was great. So thank you, everyone. All right. It was wonderful. And we still thank you. I don't care what you say. Anyway, thank you. Um, uh, let me go through the list real quick. Um, a couple things. CIA, uh, Christians in Action, our uh, stretching and health class will start up again this Wednesday again. Also, the yes, the Bible studies will be on this week again. Uh, we've got Advent Sundays throughout the month. So today, and we light the candle, we celebrate, and then afterwards there's food. What can I say? Today is popcorn, different kinds of popcorn, right? And next week is uh, Cowboy Cookie Day. Yeah, uh, there's so many good ones. I don't know. I'm not going to say which is my favorite, but stay after today. Have some popcorn, different kinds. Uh, and we have, uh, oh, the 15th is a big, 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 big day because in the morning we're going to have a children's uh, presentation, so, uh, a Christmas presentation by our kids. And we all like that. I know that. That's one. 
Uh, and then secondly, that night is the night of nativity. So bring your nativity that night, and we're going to have tables set up inside here and come and enjoy the nativity set, uh, uh, sets and have cookies and coffee. Man, we always have that food. So, all right. After the first of the year, I'll start. <laughs> Uh, let me see. There's one more thing. I'm trying to see. I had to write some up. What's that? Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. See, you're way ahead of me. You guys know. Yeah. The Christmas Eve. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Christmas Eve, our candlelight service is really awesome. And it is, it's so powerful. So we invite you to be part of that. So Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the folks you brought here. We celebrate you, Jesus, and your birth this month. We just thank you, Lord. You are so mighty and so good. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning for offering, I'm going to read out of Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. This past year, we came through just a wonderful time. It was an election year, right? Isn't that so much fun? But we learned one important phrase, fact-checking, okay? And how each side was fact-checking the other and how you found out there was very little facts in any things that they were saying and all this. But we have God wanting to be fact-checked when it comes to our tithes and our offerings. He says, test me in this and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven. He wants to be fact-checked. And if he wants to be fact-checked, I suggest we do that. We test him in that. We open our floodgates of tithes and we give to him, to the Lord, and let him do as he wishes with it and trust him that his blessing will return to us in some form or another. Shall we pray? Father, we just thank you for wanting to stand firm. And we know with you asking us to fact check you that we can believe you when you say that you will do what you say you'll do. Lord, we just ask that you bless, as you say you will, each gift and giver this morning and show them how much you love them for trusting you. In thy name we pray, amen. So, Jesus is brought before all the people after he had entered Jerusalem and all the people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, praising God, praising, thankful for Jesus coming and throwing down palm leaves and all that, and just not long after that, they, those same people were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. The same people that were all excited about him coming were disappointed. So the result of that is they did exactly that. Before they crucified Jesus, they, um, they tortured him. 
They beat him. They spat on him. They hit him. They slapped him. And then they took him, nailed him to the cross. And when he hung on the cross, as he hung on the cross, he says to the Father, on behalf of the very people who had just done all that to him and betrayed him, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's a really good lesson for us. Because no matter what anyone has done to you, it's not as bad as that. You can say amen. So, what I know about Jesus is that he laid his life down for us. And then God raised him from the dead. And that's our hope. But Jesus loved us with a love that's so beyond our comprehension. So beyond our understanding. We, we don't get it. I don't get it. All I know, it's true. That he laid his life down for us. We take communion today to remember that. To remember God's great love for us. And that he laid his life down for us. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you even though my sins helped nail you to the cross. You still love me. You still care for me. And so today, Lord, we remember that as we take communion. Help us to walk like you walked, Lord. We partake today in gratitude and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, it is time for kids to be dismissed. If you are in preschool or younger, you can come to these rooms on the side. If you're older than that, you may go with Miss Jane in the back.
So I'm uh, reminded of a few things. I was thinking this morning, one, um, when Abdiel read the verses in Spanish today, that uh, we, there are people and religions around the world that, that, um, that teach that there is one language to know God and to hear God in. Uh, and so I just am always so grateful that we have a God that understands our language, that hears us the way that we speak and, and speaks to us the way that we hear. Uh, and regardless of our language, God speaks to us and the Holy Spirit moves and navigates through all different languages. Uh, and it, it sort of spoke to me today because one of the, a couple of the songs uh, used the phrase hallelujah, which is a universal word. I don't know of a language that doesn't use that phrase. And it just, it's straight from the Hebrew. It means praise Yah is Yahweh, right? God, praise God. That's what it means. And so in the midst of our, um, our diversity in our language, right? There's this one word, praise God, that really unifies and connects all languages. So uh, when Shelly and I were dating, we were living in Southern California um, and in graduate school, we were in different colleges. And so we lived across greater Los Angeles. And when we started dating, I would come up and drive up often uh, up to her house where she lived with a roommate. And occasionally they would have parties at her house, like small gatherings of people. And they liked to play games because we were all poor graduate students. We had no money to do anything. So we would play games at the house. And one game in particular that uh, Shelly and her friends liked to play was it was charades like. I don't even remember the game or all the details, but it was like a charades. And everyone would write down different things on slips of paper and they would throw it in a bowl and then when you drew out whatever you drew out from the bowl, you were supposed to act it out. Well, one particular night, um, I don't really know what they were, if they had been talking about something or if something had come up, but these slips of paper kept coming out and they would say things like Dumbledore and Muggles and Hagrid and Lord Voldemort. Now, I didn't really know what any of this meant at the time, um, but I knew enough to know that they all were kind of related to Harry Potter and that Harry Potter was kind of a big deal within this friend group uh, and they were constantly talking about these different things. Um, people would act these things out and of course it went right over my head. I didn't have a clue who Dumbledore was and so I felt completely lost in this game. Now, what was interesting is somebody would guess and it'd be like, Hagrid, and then all of a sudden they would start telling stories about what happened on page 176 of book four, and they knew all of these details just from this one little thing. Okay, now, again, knew none of it. I knew Harry Potter something, right? Now, the reason I mention all of this is because sometimes I think when we approach Advent, which is the season that we're in, um, that sometimes we miss out on these things that are filled in by the entirety of the Old Testament. In this series this year, we're going to be looking at how Jesus fulfilled the promises. He fulfilled the promises of the Old Testament. Jesus really was the culmination of the story, the peak of God's worth th work throughout time and history for the world, and for creation. So today, uh, we're going to look at really just one primary verse, and it's Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Now, I don't know how many of you have read Matthew chapter 1, uh, but this is what 1.1 1, 1 says, just Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, if I kept reading the genealogy, most of your eyes would start to glaze over with boredom. A whole bunch of names that most of us don't know how to pronounce. Uh, and most of us, the, the story, most of them, the stories aren't even fully in the Old Testament. Don't worry, I'm not going to read it today. But packed in that one little verse at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew is an, a whole lot that I fear we miss goes over our head just like Muggles, Voldemort, Hagrid went over my head in the game, the Harry Potter game I just described. You see, packed in that little verse is a hearkening back to the entirety of the Old Testament. It is saying, 
And Matthew will continue to say throughout his entire gospel that Jesus is the peak. He is the fulfillment of God's plan for restoration, for restoring our relationships with God and with each other. He is the climax of God's plan for the blessing of all peoples. So during this season of Advent, the season on which we are expectantly waiting for the coming of Jesus, we reflect on how the Gospels tell us that Jesus is indeed the fulfillment of the promises. So to unpack this briefly, uh, in Matthew 1, the readers of Matthew would have known the Old Testament backward and forward, similar to Shelley's friends knowing Harry Potter in the same way. They would have filled in a whole host of details around a few phrases. So in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it starts with a Greek phrase, which will be on the screen in Greek. It says, Biblos Genesis. Now, I don't know how many of you know Greek. I don't know it super well. But Biblos is the word where we get the word Bible from, right? It just means book. That's all it means. Genesis, if I look at it the way that we, if I wrote it out, it would say Genesis. Genesis, the book of Genesis. And what that literally means is the book of origin or the book of beginning, the book of where it all began, right? Which is why in the Old Testament, Genesis is the book of origin, right? But the readers of this two-word phrase would have immediately jumped back to the book of Genesis in the Old Testament and filled in the entirety of that story in that phrase. They would have taken all of it. Now, most of us, you know, we're not going to remember all the details, but I'm just going to talk about one part of it, one tiny part, and that is the origin. In that little phrase, Biblos Genesis, it goes back to the creation, to the beginning of it all. It would have alerted the readers of the entire story of Genesis 1 through 3, actually the entire book, but Genesis 1 through 3 is what we'll talk about today. They would have known that this phrase indicated Jesus' arrival was in fact a re-creation, a new beginning, a restoration of God's work that began in the Garden of Eden it would naturally take the hearer of that phrase back, back to that creation moment and to all that God intended in the Garden of Eden. So briefly, we're going to flash back to creation, um, and we're just going to talk very briefly about some things in the creation account. In summary, God created everything, seen and unseen, and he called it good. He took the darkness, the emptiness, the chaos, and he created light, fullness, order, and security. He created man and woman, and he called them good. God gave humanity a purpose and a home. He created humankind in his image, and he gave us as people the task of ruling over and caring for creation. We were meant to dwell with God, and his presence would be with us in the garden. G.K. Beale and Mitchell Kim word it in this way. It says, God's presence in his dwelling place, meaning at this point in the garden, satiates or fills our longings for relationship, satisfaction, and significance. And the opening chapters of Genesis show how God intended those longings to be properly satisfied in Eden. God made us for himself and his images in the garden, as his images in the garden. Genesis 1 and 2. God's presence gives life and purpose in Eden. The Bible tells us in Genesis 3 that God originally intended to walk with humanity in a casual stroll-like behavior in the garden to dwell with us there. Christopher Wright words it this way. Genesis 
describes God's habit of spending the cool of the day just strolling with Adam and Eve in the garden. The covenant presence of God will be a return to the intimacy, the closeness of Eden. Ultimately, God's presence among his people must point to the blessing of his presence in all the earth. We know the story. The garden was a paradise. God dwelled with humankind. He walked leisurely in the garden with Adam and Eve. His presence, his presence marked the good life, the abundant life. God was with us. He gave us a job and a purpose, a mission, and we were built and created to find our fulfillment in a perfect relationship with God, pure relationships with each other. We were created to reflect him in his image, to be caretakers and stewards of his creation. It was in the garden that we were supposed to have rest in the presence and dwelling of our God. The trouble is, as we know, that humanity chose a different way. We thought we knew better. The serpent tricked humanity, and as a result, people became separated from God. Mary Conway puts it this way. Both Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden and suffer separation from the presence of God. A mark of fallen humanity is our separation from God, the brokenness in that relationship between us and God. God can feel far and distant or non-existent. Our relationships with each other are strained and difficult at best, if not hostile and toxic. Indeed, Scripture tells us that all of creation groans and cries out. In our separation from God, we are broken. But God, God's story in the entirety of the Old Testament is a tale of multiple attempts to restore his relationship with humanity. In fact, all throughout the Old Testament, from the cloud by day, fire by night presence of God in the wilderness when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, to the tabernacle and the temple of God in Jerusalem, there are symbols of God's presence. God's presence is what makes God's people God's people. The presence of God is what defines people as a people belonging to God. So, coming from our flashback, we're going to jump back to Matthew 1.1, Biblos Genesis. The moment of recreation has come. God's presence is here. God, amen, God is beginning the process of restoring earth back to the Eden he originally created. In Jesus, God is with us. Matthew 1.23 says this, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel. Sure. <laughs> no worries. It says, the virgin, this is Matthew 123, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Amen. Preach. <laughs> Emmanuel. No, you're good. Emmanuel. God fires me up. <laughs> it's awesome, man. Jesus is the fulfillment, the fulfillment of God's presence. He is God with us. He is the fulfillment of God's presence. Jesus will walk with us in the garden, as the old hymn says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Packed into Matthew 1.1, we see 
that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise, that Jesus' work and mission was to restore the conditions of creation in the garden, that we would be able to walk with him, that we would have reconciled relationships with each other. In Jesus, God is curing the curse, the curse of that fall, of that separation. Jesus. So what do we do? What do we do with this? First, we invite Jesus in. Now, some of us have heard a lot about Jesus, but we may think of him in a distant way or perhaps as a historical figure. But I'd encourage you to invite Jesus in. Invite Jesus to walk with you, to be present with you. Jesus will draw near to you if you ask him to. For those that don't know Jesus, invite him in. If you have never made a decision to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus or have more questions, please ask. Ask someone. He is faithful to keep his promises. Emmanuel, God is with us. We can also walk with him. Now, for those of us who have already invited Jesus in, we can be encouraged to walk with Jesus. Now, I have come to view my walk with Jesus like any other relationship. When Shelly and I had been married, um, and I joke that this was before kids, right? But um, we had been married a couple of years, and we went back to Arkansas, which is where Shelly's from. And we were there for, I don't remember why, but we were there. And at one point, one of Shelly's older sisters, who at that point had been married about 10 years, looked at us, and I don't know what we had done. I don't remember why she said this, but she, and we'd only been married, Shelly and I had been married about two years. But her older sister said, ugh, gosh, rolled her eyes and said, I see that y'all are still in the honeymoon phase. Now, <laughs> anybody who has been married any length of time, knows that relationships ebb and flow. You have the honeymoon phase. It's great. And then you have moments of real intimacy and connection. And then you have a whole host of surviving, right? (laughs) We have seasons where we're close and we're able to like really, you know, wax eloquent. We poetically talk about each other and our love for each other. And then we have seasons in the rat rat race of life where we're just struggling to get from work to basketball practice to dance rehearsal to swim lesson. And we have this illusion that we don't eat junk food, but we're really just trying to throw something on the table in five seconds, anything that's quick and simple and easy, right? And we hardly see each other, right? We're passing in the night. We don't notice each other. We have moments where we're just trying to control our partner, Right? Or we're trying to control each other. I don't like it. You leave your shoes there. I don't like it that you leave your clothes there. I don't like it. Just trying to control, control, control each other. We have seasons where relationships are hard and difficult. Now, I'm not sure Shelly's sister would say that we are in the honeymoon phase anymore. But there is one thing, one thing I know for sure. I love that woman more than ever. Because... We have walked through life together. We have spent sleepless nights. We have endured the loss of loved ones, the loss of jobs, moments of sickness, you know, the normal ups and downs of everyday life. Walking with Jesus is really similar. (laughs) He is ever-present and faithful, but just walking with him in the things of life that are routine and mundane and hard and good and glorious, all of it. When I left for India years and years ago, my mom had been battling cancer for a few years. Now, I remember sitting outside one night before I left and looking up and seeing the full moon. I remember then telling my mother um, that the same moon rose and set over India that rose and set over Texas, which is where I grew up. All throughout my time in India, in the pitch black of electricity shortages, 
I would walk home or step out on the balcony of my apartment and I would see that moon rising and setting over the mountains. And I would think the same moon rises and sets on India as it does in Texas. Somehow, it always made me feel just a touch closer to my mom. That despite the distance, how far India was from Texas, my mom was somehow closer. As Matthew tells us, Jesus is God with us. He wants to walk with us. He stepped out of heaven, drew near to us, to humanity. He bridged the distance and the separation. He came as a poor, humble baby to be present with us, his prized creation. He came to walk with us through our most stressful days at work, to talk with us when we deal with illness, hospitals, and health insurance. He, tells us, he will tell us that we are his own when we feel alone and hurt. Even death cannot separate us from Jesus. God Amen. is with us. Thirdly, you can, we can, live out God's mission and purpose for us. Brad Kelly words it this way. He says, The God who appears at the beginning of the Old Testament story is the one who overcomes any and all chaos that threatens life and creates and sustains an abundant life. The human race is called to be the image of that God, to represent God's life-giving ways in the world through right relationships that allow all creation to enjoy divine blessing and nourishment. May the presence of God, our Jesus, our Emmanuel, radically transform our us as we walk with him. God is with us. He is with us through it all. May our walk with Jesus allow us to reflect his presence in our lives. May we extend the abundant life and restored relationships he offers. And may the world around us experience the blessing of God's presence in and through our lives. If you'll stand as we pray. Most high God, we thank you so much that when you created us, we were good. <laughs> that you created humankind to dwell with us, to walk with us in the garden. And despite the brokenness of our world, despite our sin and our alienation from you, you stepped into that distance and into that separation by sending Jesus as a humble and lowly baby. And we pray during this season of Advent that we would remember and reflect on Jesus as our Emmanuel, that you are here dwelling with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.